Uh, I'd like to say what a pleasure it is to be here with all of you today. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are aware that tom tomorrow, Friday, uh, is the uh, World Pneumonia Day. And that's very important to have such a symposium as we're doing uh, at that time. Okay, so I would <clears throat> hope that you are going to enjoy the symposium with me uh, as we go along and talk about the, uh, the uh, issues related to pneumococcal pneumonia. Okay, could I have my slides, please? Okay, so maybe I should share my screen <clears throat> and show you um, my slides. Um, so this symposium is called the value of pneumococcal vaccination in adults with comorbid conditions. Here's the disclaimer to say that these slides of mine uh, are my thoughts and uh, issues related to that. And here is my own personal disclaimer, and it really relates to my participation and interest and passion with uh, adult vaccination, but particularly with pneumococcal uh, vaccination. So, my, the contents of my talk are in the next slide. What they actually show is um, that I'll talk about a little bit about adult immunization, the myriad of risk factors, the differences between the two vaccines and recommendations and reimbursement internationally, uh, the efficacy and effectiveness of PCV13, and efficacy studies with PPV23. And I certainly will be telling you about the new vaccines on the horizon, uh, which you may be able to um, use shortly, uh, followed by conclusions. And I think the important issue is adult immunization. And this is an issue as an adult physician that I think is essential to be addressed. Vaccination is recommended throughout life to prevent vaccine preventable diseases and their sequelae. Now, the primary focus of vaccination programs has been childhood vaccination. For adults, it's mainly been preventative uh, measures and medical care for individuals with chronic diseases. Although we know that in adults and the elderly, there's an increased emphasis on preventing infectious diseases. But adult vaccine coverage, despite all of this, remains low for most of the routinely recommended vaccines. And so we have an urgent need to address this problem. Going on to the next topic is related to factors that are risk factors for pneumococcal infection, S pneumonia infection. These include on the left age, the very young and the elderly, 
host factors, immunocompetent hosts and immunocompromised hosts with underlying chronic diseases, environmental factors on and on the right, um, factors related to things like cigarette smoking, alcohol use, and so on. So this is a slide looking at common comorbidities associated with pneumonia in the Asia Pacific region. I know that this is an older slide, but it's quite a nice slide and I'm sure the values have gone up significantly. It includes Singapore and as you can see, a number of other uh, countries in the Asia Pacific region. And you can see that things like uh, bronchopulmonary disease, cigarette smoking, um, cardiovascular disorders and so on are common in this region and represent major risk factors for uh, pneumococcal disease. One of the issues that's very important is that individuals with comorbidities often don't just have one comorbidity. So they may have, for example, uh, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obesity, diabetes, and cardiac disease. And in fact, up to 30% of individuals and slightly more uh, in a study from the United States have more than one comorbidities. So let me take you through this. The horizontal axis is age, and you can see age amplifies all the findings. Now, if you are younger and have no comorbid illness, hopefully you can see my cursor, it looks sort of, a, to me, a purple color, you have a slight increased risk of pneumococcal infection. One comorbid illness increases it, two increases it further, three increases it substantially. And in fact, the risk here in individuals who've got, say, what I mentioned before, <clears throat> hypertension, diabetes, obesity, uh, cardiac disease, their risk of pneumococcal infection, the incidence is much higher than, as you can see in the gray bar, which are individuals at highest risk. These are individuals who are immunocompromised, HIV, hemopoietic stem cell transplants, and so on. And this occurs, the so-called risk stacking occurs uh, in up to 30% of individuals. Now, there are two pneumococcal vaccines that are registered and licensed in a number of countries throughout the world. These are the only two that are registered and licensed currently for adults, the conjugate vaccine, PCV13, the polysaccharide, PPV or PPSV23, that has all of those except 6A and additional ones. Now, what is the difference between these two vaccines? So the older polysaccharide vaccine consists of polysaccharide antigens. And these are sugar molecules and they are components of the pneumococcal capsule. When you put 23 of them together, you then end up with PPSV or PPV23. What do you have in the conjugate vaccine on the right? You've got these polysaccharides, but they are conjugated or chemically linked to a protein carrier. And the current one, which has been the common one with the conjugate vaccines has been CRIM197, which is a diphtheria toxoid. And then if you conjugate this, you end up with the adult, other adult uh, pneumococcal vaccine, PCV13. Now they have different immunologies. You can see on the left, the polysaccharide vaccine is T-cell independent. On the right, it's T-cell dependent. So <clears throat> in terms of how it works, the polysaccharide vaccine consisting of polysaccharide antigens stimulates naive B cells, produces a mature plasma cells, and you can see it produces antibodies. Once again, T cell independent. If you then talk about the conjugate vaccine, it goes through that same process I've mentioned. 
But because of the immunogenic protein carrier, it interacts with the T cell. And this causes an exuberant outpouring of both antibodies, but also the production of memory B cells, which in fact should allow uh, a long lasting memory in individuals who have received the conjugate vaccine. And you may know, and I'll mention again, that the vaccine efficacy or effect does wane in those who've had the polysaccharide antigen. <clears throat> this is a slide I always show because one of the big issues is the memory B cell, MBC pool. The better it is, the higher it is, the greater it is, the better the long-term memory. So if you've given this cartoon uh, panel A, two doses of PCV13, you have a great memory B cell pool. If you give the conjugate first followed by the polysaccharide, well, the memory B cell pool is moderately increased. If you give the polysaccharide followed by the conjugate, you get very little. And if you uh, give the polysaccharide alone, virtually nothing. And this is what's given rise to the concept that the best way to vaccinate a naive individual is to go with the conjugate vaccine first, followed by the polysaccharide uh, vaccine. Sorry, followed by either the conjugate vaccine again or by the polysaccharide, but not preferentially to start with the polysaccharide vaccine. <clears throat> so I've mentioned these differences polysaccharide on the left, conjugate on the right, T-cell independent, T-cell dependent. You can't use the polysaccharide vaccine in children under the age of two years because the response is in the IgG2 subclass of IgG, and that doesn't mature until about 18 months, two years of age, whereas the conjugate can be used from a young age. Protection uh, duration wanes with the polysaccharide, but we think it's much more long lasting with the conjugate. But this is one of the big issues is nasopharyngeal con uh, carriage. For most pneumococcal infections, the primary step is nasopharyngeal col uh, colonization with or nasopharyngeal carriage with pneumococci, followed by you then uh, getting a pneumococcal infection from the bugs you are carrying. And the polysaccharide vaccine doesn't interfere with that process. And people believe that it, <clears throat> you know, that you need to um, get rid of it. The polysaccharide doesn't change nasopharyngeal carriage, but the Conjugate vaccine does. It doesn't eradicate all nasopharyngeal carriage. And I was in a meeting earlier today where people expected that the conjugate vaccine would eradicate all colonization. It doesn't eradicate it, but it modifies it significant for them to have reduced carriage. And what reduced carriage means, because if children who are vaccinated don't carry pneumococci, they can't pass it on to their brothers and sisters who are not vaccinated or their parents or even the grandparents. So as of April this year, <clears throat> you can see that a large number of countries advocate or have included uh, PCV13. So that's about 150 cases. So um, about 50 countries. So let's talk about recommendations, current recommendations in different parts of the world and reimbursement. You can see that uh, this is the United States. This is ACIP down here or the CDC. It recommends uh, conjugate for many cases and it reimburses. It recommends uh, PC, uh, PPV23 or PPSV23 for many uh, individuals and reimburses. The one difference was that in adults 65 years and above, in 2019, they looked at data, the ACIP, 
And they found that because of the schedule and the comprehensive childhood rollout, there were very few uh, cases of PPD-23 uh, uh, serotype pneumonia in the elderly. And so they said, okay, give the, con uh, the polysaccharide, but discuss with the patient whether they want the conjugate vaccine in addition. So that became shared decision-making. A number of countries have not gone that route, and I'll mention a little bit of more of this as we go along. So let me show you Hong Kong, um, which is an area close to you. They recommend conjugate, they recommend polysaccharide, but even though they are a well-resourced society in general terms, they do not reimburse or fund it. What about Singapore? Well, Singapore has recommendations, but it's both governmental and or society, and most of them recommend both vaccines, uh, different intervals based on whether the person is immunocompetent or just elderly, or whether they have immunocompromising conditions such as chronic renal failure, CSF leaks, et cetera, and immunocompromised individuals. South Africa has a similar recommendations, and I don't mean to go through this in any detail. So we suggest that in vaccine naive individuals, they should receive PCD13, followed in high risk and immunocompromised individuals with PPSV23, and in those <clears throat> two months later, in those with the PPSV23. And if they are purely elderly or have comorbid conditions, the uh, combination uh, of the two vaccines could take place in sequence, but one year later. Now, I think it's important to remember that this is the pyramid of pneumococcal disease in adults. It says US, it is US data, yeah, there are US data, but it's the very similar around the world. The pyramid looks like this. In green, right at the top of the pyramid, are the invasive diseases, meningitis, bacteremia, sepsis, etc. The case numbers are low, but the mortality rate is extremely high. But what drives epidemiology of pneumococcal infection in adults is the non-bacteremic, non-invasive pneumococcal infection. A much lower case fatality rate, but because of the large number of cases, as you can see, many fold increase compared to invasive disease, this component, the blue component, is what drives epi not only epidemiology, but morbidity and mortality of pneumococcal disease in adults. So there have been a number of uh, studies. This is looking at efficacy of um, uh, the vaccine, uh, looking at the conjugate vaccine in a population. So what you do is take the population out of the equation. You do a randomized controlled trial, sorry, where some of the population are being vaccinated with PCD13 and some not. So that's taken out the equation. So some get vaccine, others don't, and you look at the occurrence of disease. And I'm sure many of you know these slides. This is the Capita study done in the Netherlands, almost 80,000 adults. These were elderly by definition, 65 and above. The primary endpoint was prevention of an episode of vaccine type pneumococcal cap, whether bacteremic or not. And there you can see a reduction there of 46%. The secondary endpoint was on individuals who were not bacteremic, non invasive pneumococcal disease or vaccine types, and it was. 45%, and for invasive pneumococcal disease, so this was not necessarily just pneumonia, it could have been others, there was an excellent uh, vaccine efficacy of 75%. And what was pleasing in the study, which lasted almost four years, 
is that this duration of protection lasted for the entire period. And if you look at the number of cases, you can see that the difference between placebo and uh, those who got vaccination continue to diverge even after four years, suggesting long-term protection. And I don't mean to go through the slide. You're welcome to read it if you wish. But I think it's important to say that in these elderly patients, uh, some of the immunogenicity studies like OPA teeters and IgG concentrations persisted. Uh, it didn't matter what comorbid illness you had or whether you were a smoker, uh, the efficacy was still there. Although interesting, the second bullet point said its efficacy in diabetics was even better. Um, and there were other things. Uh, there were persistent uh, effects in at-risk older adults was found to be cost-effective uh, and so on. Now, one of the conditions where there are very few studies showing uh, efficacy of uh, any of the pneumococcal vaccines is COPD and COPD exacerbations. So this comes from further research conducted thereafter uh, following Capita, they divided individuals with COPD in those who didn't have exacerbations compared to those who had frequent exacerbations. Some were vaccinated, others not. Some were vaccinated, others not. And on the right, you can see that hospitalizations, um, you know, for exacerbations mainly of COPD were much lower in vaccinated individuals. They also did this, and I don't want you to go through this in any uh, uh, significance, but in involved capita, there were those at risk, there were those at not, no risk, some got uh, PCD13, others got placebo. And what you can see, and I want you to concentrate on this group, this is the at group elderly. And you can see that their effic the efficacy of the um, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine was not much different from them at cases that had no risk. Obviously, it was highest in those, but not significantly, who had no risks, but it worked both in those at risk and those not at risk. And then there are a number of studies because we know that serotype 3 pneumococcus is our uh, a big challenge because many of the vaccine types don't show adequate protection against serotype 3. But there's quite a lot of efficacy and effectiveness studies showing that with PCB13, based on different endpoints, as you can see, that PCB13 has great protection against serotype 3. Now, as opposed to efficacy studies, there are effectiveness studies. Here, what the study is, the vaccine is given to those in the population who wish to have it and not given to those who wish not to have it. And then you look at those who've got pneumonia and you look at those who've got, uh, who were vaccinated or not vaccinated. And then you look at what kind of serotype type of pneumonia they have. And this is the Louisville study. They used a, a test negative design. It's a real world study, and this is quite common. So they found that overall, a little bit over 2,000 patients were hospitalized for pneumonia. 68 cases had serotypes containing PCB13 and a number of test negative controls had uh, pneumonia, but sero PCB13 serotypes were not found. And this translates to a vaccine effectiveness for all type uh, PCB13 type pneumonia, which is pretty good, uh, but even in the non-bacteremic infections, which as I mentioned is your bugbear, uh, a very good effectiveness. And you can see even in, in the very elderly and immunocompromised, a pretty good vaccine effectiveness. Now, 
I need to counterbalance it by showing you some studies uh, of the PPV23. There are studies suggesting efficacy, there are studies suggesting effic uh, effectiveness, there are very few randomized control trials. So this is a, um, a specialized meta-analysis of 21 studies. I'm showing it because it's one of the more recent studies. It involved a large number of adults and they used a two-stage Bayesian meta-analysis methodology to combine, as you can see, randomized control trials and observational studies. And you can see the breakdown, uh, case control, randomized and cohort. Very little in the way of randomized control trials. They did seem to suggest here in the bottom right hand corner that it tended to work well in all study types for invasive pneumococcal disease. Um, but let me show you the data for IPD. So here is the forest plot. You can see overall benefit, the diamond is to the left of the midline. So an overall benefit of the polysaccharide vaccine in these very different types of studies of the polysaccharide vaccine. But there were two caveats. The overall efficacy, as you can see, was quite low, almost not significant. And the one study by Mariyama from Japan tended to contribute a significant amount to the meta-analysis of the vaccine efficacy. Now, there's been a lot of debate about the Mariyama study. It was a study done in Japan in individuals, elderly living in long-term care facilities. And you could look at data that is pro the Mariyama study, but against the Mariyama studies. But the issue here with the meta-analysis using the Bayesian uh, two-stage or two-way analysis is that the data are overwhelmed, particularly by one study. Now, I think it would be wrong to say that there's no efficacy of the polysaccharide vaccine. There clearly is. Earlier studies that suggest that the polysaccharide is effective against IPD and among generally healthy young adults, but there was no demonstration consistently of efficacy in high-risk cases, including adults and children with underlying condition and highly immunosuppressed individuals. There were others that came out with statements in these early years, the FDA, the CHMP, etc. No consistent efficacy for that. But there was a more recent systematic review and meta-analysis, and this is often talked about as the Nordic review, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and so on. They compared the two vaccines with all the data in the literature. It was an update of the literature. They said that PCB13 was dominated by the CAPTA study. But the problem with the, even though it was a randomized control trial, but the polysaccharide study was based on largely on studies of moderate quality. Uh, and a lot of observational studies. And they said it's very difficult to compare. But in 2020, uh, through the WHO and so on, the advisory group on immunization changed the 2008 statement and said in high income countries, and this obviously referred to the Nordic countries I've mentioned to you, that uh, PPD23 um, was as protective of the, uh, the 13 serotypes in PCV. But the big issues for low middle income countries, South Africa, and many countries in your region and Middle East and so on, and other parts of Africa, there were limited data on many aspects by which to make decisions. So they suggested that uh, childhood vaccination uh, programs in high, in high income countries uh, have done extremely well. They have even caused indirect protection in adults um, and they both effective against IPD and 
a pneumococcal non-bacteremic camp. But of course, the data for low and middle income countries, LMRCs, is still not uh, certain. So this is the milestones of the ACIP, the CDC. Over the years, there were various recommendations. And one of the latest ones in 2019, the ACIP in 2015 had said in the elderly, give the conjugate vaccine followed by the polysaccharide one year later. So this is individuals who are elderly, but they don't have immunocompromising conditions or CSF leak or cochlear implant and so on. And they changed this in 2019 because in the US, there seems to be no residual PCV13 type disease in the elderly. And they said, so rather just give PPV23 routinely, and discuss with the patient whether they also wanted to get the conjugate. Um, this excludes patients who've got immunocompromising conditions, CSF leak or cochlear implant, who should still get both vaccines. And why they decided this, as I said to you, in the US, so this is very US centric, they said incidence of PCB 13 type disease was uh, at historical levels. The recommendations in 2014, which was the initial one in 2015, um, is that introducing PCV13 in elderly populations didn't have any extra benefit in the US, but it is recognized that PCV13 is safe. And so they went along that route. <coughs> Excuse me. So the question is, and I've thought this up, should this be what we do in all regions? And my answer is clearly not, and it's not what we're going to recommend in South Africa. The burden of pneumococcal disease varies in different regions. It depends on the prevalence of smoking, obviously much higher in the developing world than in the developed world, amount of HIV, and HIV is what drives the epidemic of pneumococcal infections in South Africa. Um, we have one of the highest burdens and one of the highest HIV rollout programs. And despite our rollout program, which is pretty comprehensive, we still, uh, and, and with great ARVs recommended as in first world countries, we still have significant uh, pneumococcal disease. And then there's evidence that herd protection is different geographically. It may relate to this uh, susceptibility I've mentioned, but it also depends which childhood vaccination is being used, what the coverage rate is and so on. So there's a suggestion that herd protection or commonly called herd immunity has a limit. We certainly know that older age and comorbidity does reduce the herd protection. And there are various other issues which we won't go through. So let me show you South Africa. The incidence of IPD in adults and children. Our surveillance doesn't accurately uh, uh, classify whether we're talking about adults or children. It talks overall. Um, in 2019 was the same as 2018 and our invasive pneumococcal disease inc uh, incidence over the last five years is relatively unchanged. It is particularly found in children and adults over 25 years. Why 25 years? Because our HIV is heterosexually spread and that's when uh, the sexually active years are in general. And so even in younger adults in South Africa, we have peaks from the age of 25 and clearly also in the elderly. You can see in both children under five, but even in uh, older persons over five, 30% are pneumococcal PCD13 serotypes. The mortality for these infections is extremely high. And you can see that HIV is a major risk, but many of the cases of RPD have other conditions in other than HIV, and the top three were smoking, including diabetes mellitus, uh, 
as well as chronic lung and chronic kidney disease. And many of these then would have represented adults. So I do need to mention to you as we get towards the end of the talk that there are new uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccines on the horizon. These are the two, PCV15 and PCV20. So in yellow, these are the serotypes in PCV13. In PCV15, the same serotypes with two more. In PCV20, the same serotypes plus the two more of PCV15 and additional. And you can see it's pretty close, uh, PCV20, to what's present in PPSV23. So the CDC had a, a, a numerous discussions, and this discussion occurred, as you can see below, very, very recently. And they looked at the recommendations at the current time in individuals 19 to 64, if they don't have underlying conditions, no recommendation for vaccine. If they have chronic medical conditions, give the polysaccharide, but in high risk conditions, give the conjugate followed sometime later by PPD 23. Um, so there's a difference between the chronic conditions and the immunocompromised and high risk conditions. And they uh, were looking at the following considerations. Should we give or recommend that it gets given when it's available, PCB20 alone, or should it be PCB13 followed by PPV23? And then they looked at the elderly and they looked at younger adults. And these are the chronic diseases they looked at below. And their suggestion was in all of this uh, group, Based on age 65, one should recommend PCB20 in the future or PCB15 followed by PPV23. On risk based, here is the same thing no risk, no problem, but with risk groups, replace it by PCB20 or PCB15 and 23. And they based this on a number of advantages. Uh, of and disadvantages of the use of the PCB20 alone or the use of PCB15 and PPV23 with the consideration that PCB15 only added two additional serotypes. So on an age-based recommendation, they remained with the age of 65 or older although there was debate of going down to the lower age, which was the first PCB recommendation of age 50, um, they shelved that for the moment. And they then said either recommendation is PCB20 or PCB15 followed by PPV23. So here are the risk base. I won't go through that again. And I'm gonna end off by saying, Whatever vaccine one uses, even beyond pneumococcal vaccine, for a successful vaccination program, you need buy-in by many stakeholders. The government needs to come into this process. Often it is responsible for funding vaccine provisions and establishing policy, as well as other things such as surveillance, which is very important to dictate what we do. You need to have healthcare professionals understanding, knowledgeable, and recommend, uh, recommending vaccines. And you need understanding by the public. And I think many of you all know what's happened with us with some misinformation that has gone about with COVID vaccinations, certainly in some countries. And the public need to understand the uh, medical issues with the vaccinations, benefits and potential risks, and understand why it's important. And central to all of this is our media. And I've spent a lot of my time this week preparing media uh, presentations for World Pneumonia Day, which hopefully you all know uh, is tomorrow. And the pneumococcus remains a very important cause of that pneumonia. So what I'm going to say to end off with is global burden of pneumococcal disease remains considerable. 
There are differences around the world. It goes without saying in the prevalence and risk factors and so on, and even the recommendations. And I think we should make it appropriate to the area we live in. Certainly PCB13 has been great in children, and it also has been associated with herd protection or herd immunity in adults, but there are differences around the world. And we know that in many countries, I showed you South Africa, and I'm sure that mirrors a lot of LMICs, low and middle income countries. But even in countries such as Germany, Italy, and more recently Spain, have shown that there is a limit to herd protection or immunity. So vaccinations in adults, particularly, but not limited to special vaccines, will further reduce the burden of pneumococcal infection. So I'd like to say what a pleasure it has been for me to be with you this evening. I would have loved to be there in person. I've been uh, to Singapore many, many times and have enjoyed every single one of the visits. I hope you have got something out of it. And I think it's appropriate to have this kind of conversation, particularly the day before World uh, Pneumonia Day. So thank you very much for your attention and your patience. Nothing. Um, thank you. Thank you for that excellent lecture, especially since today is actually World Pneumonia Day in Singapore. Um, there's nothing on the screen from uh, the virtual side of our audience with regards to questions. And uh, maybe I should start the ball rolling by asking a few questions. Um, can, can I find out from you, Professor Feldman, what is your opinion about the future of pneumococcal vaccine, especially those that are more protein-based, targeted to the serotype independent protection? Can we have your view on this? Yeah, I, I, a great question, Professor O. Um, I mean, I clearly think. having vaccines that are serotype based means that we tend to be always chasing our tail. Um, one goes on and increases the serotypes and then one often gets serotype replacement Sometimes even with serotypes that weren't previously uh, virulent, but now become virulent. So ideally, it would be nice to go on to new generation vaccines that are serotype independent. Um, there are some ways of doing it. Uh, a lot of my research work has been on uh, the pneumococcal toxin pneumolysis. Mm -hmm. It's present in all virulent pneumococci. It's an extremely important virulence factor. And one way to go about developing sort of serotype independence is instead of CRIM197, have pneumolysin as the protein carrier. Mm -hmm. It's not only immunogenic, which is required, but it's present in almost all active uh, pneumococci, virulent pneumococci, and, it do, and antibodies to uh, pneumolysin do get produced, even in individuals who recover from pneumococcal infection. So that would give serotype coverage if it was a conjugate vaccine, those serotypes, plus an independent protein carrier that would add a serotype, a uh, non-serotype protection. The other way is obviously to develop vaccines that do not rely on the pneumococcal polysaccharides and the serotypes. I think that may well be something for the future. It would be serotype independent. It would not, it would not be influenced by a change in serotypes. Uh, that may occur uh, due to pressures of the vaccine. And yes, I think we are now probably on third generation pneumococcal conjugate vaccines, and we may go on to additional uh, 
serotype-based vaccines, but also should be working towards a serotype-independent overall uh, pneumococcal vaccine. Thank you for that, that reassurance that we are actually moving forward to other platforms for pneumococcal vaccines. Um, maybe can I just sidetrack a bit and ask you, what's the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the incidence of invasive pneumococcal disease and the risk of pneumococcal co-infection with SARS-CoV-2? Okay, Professor, thank you. Another excellent, well, two questions. So let me start with one. What do we know that's happened to invasive pneumococcal infections not only invasive pneumococcal infections, but community acquired infections such as pneumococcal, haemophilus, moraxella, and other common um, community acquired infections during COVID. And what has happened, and this has happened in most countries of the world, there was a major pu publication by Brueggemann which included data from South Africa, but it included uh, data from a number of countries in the world. And what we've seen during COVID is there has been a significant decrease in community acquired infections, particularly invasive community acquired infections, such as with the pneumococcus. And it's attributed to largely to our uh, attempts at preventing COVID transmission. So lockdown, social distancing, hand hygiene, use of uh, facial masks, and so on. Because as I mentioned, in most cases, say of pneumococcal infection, uh, one acquires colonization from a person with pneumococcal colonization, and then one may come down with the pneumococcal infection. And all these efforts for preventing COVID infection have decreased these community type infections. There hasn't been a similar reduction in nosocomial infections and one would understand that easily why that occurs. Um, so your next question was what about co-infections and secondary infections? And we've written a lot about it. We've had a lot of interest in this. And I do need to say, if you look for them carefully, you can find both co-infections and particularly secondary infections in patients with COVID and COVID pneumonia. Um, these infections are important because the occurrence of a co-infection and secondary infection is often associated with more severe illness. And it's certainly, they certainly seem to be associated with the worst outcome. Yep. Now, there is a difference between co-infection and superinfection. Co-infection means your patient presents with COVID and at that time has another infection, like a pneumococcal infection. And there are studies showing that the pneumococcus does play a role in spite of what we said in the first, answering the first question. And we also know that there are super infections which occur sometime down the line, uh, maybe even in the intensive care unit while the patient's on ventilation. And that would be understood by most of us to be nosocomial infections and they occur there too. So yes, if you look hard enough, you find them. They are important to identify because they need potentially antibiotics or antiviral therapy in addition in their own right. But they, because of the understanding that they do occur, there has been a tendency to complete overuse of antibiotics, which is against antimicrobial stewardship uh, incentives. And so identification of them has clinical re relevance to try and avoid us overusing antibiotics, which in the COVID era has been enormous. Thank you for that clarification. And I, can I ask you one last question? Um, should the PCV15 
and the PCV20 be introduced into the childhood immunization schedule once it has been evaluated fully by drug trials, vaccine trials, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> once again, the third and most difficult question you've asked. It, it's very difficult to answer that question. Um, much of the emphasis and the impetus has been um, on using these vaccines in adults. Um, in children, in general, the vaccines that were developed, the conjugate vaccines that were developed, were developed against the most common serotypes in childhood. And as you will know from the childhood studies of PCB13 and the herd protection studies in adults, there has been quite a comprehensive reduction in pneumococcal infections in children who are vaccinated and as a result of herd protection. A lot of these additional uh, serotypes we worried about have potentially occurred in older children and in adults and in the elderly. Mm. And therefore, a lot of what the impetus has been with these high um, serotype conjugate vaccines has been particularly in adults. Um, I think, you know, the answer to your question is time will tell. Um, but yeah, it's a great question. And the question is, well, shouldn't we give them to children? And then maybe there would be better herd protection in adults, even in some of those areas where the herd protection limit has occurred. So I think we still got a few minutes, but if there are no other pressing questions for Professor Feldman, we can call it to a close. We had a very, very long first day. I think we all are quite having mental fatigue at the moment. <laughs> so thank you so much for that very excellent lecture and giving us food for thought on World Pneumonia Day. Thank you, Professor Feldman. I hope to see thank you Thank you very soon. much. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's been my absolute pleasure to be here with you. Thank you.